the first man-carrying aeroplane capable of sustained free flight by albert francis zam this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the first man-carrying aeroplane capable of sustained free flight langley's success as a pioneer in aviation by albert francis zam it is doubtful whether any person of the present generation will be able to appraise correctly the contributions thus far made to the development of the practical flying machine the aeroplane as it stands today is the creation not of any one man but rather of three generations of men it was the invention of the nineteenth century it will be the fruition if not the perfection of the twentieth century during the long decades succeeding the time of sir george cayley builder of aerial gliders and sagacious exponent of the laws of flight continuous progress has been made in every department of theoretical and practical aviation progress in accumulating the data of aeromechanics in discovering the principles of this science in improving the instruments of aerotechnic research in devising the organs and perfecting the structural details of the present-day flying machine from time to time numerous aerial craftsmen have flourished in the world's eye only to pass presently into comparative obscurity while others too neglected or too poorly appreciated in their own day subsequently have risen to high estimation and permanent honour in the minds of men something of this latter fortune was fated to the late secretary of the smithsonian institution for a decade and a half dr langley had toiled unremittingly to build up the basic science of mechanical flight and finally to apply it to practical use he had made numerous model aeroplanes propelled by various agencies by india rubber by steam by gasoline all operative and inherently stable then with great confidence he had constructed for the war department a man-flyer which was the duplicate on a fourfold scale of his successful gasoline model but on that luckless day in december nineteen o three when he expected to inaugurate the era of substantial aviation an untoward accident to his launching gear badly crippled his carefully and adequately designed machine the aeroplane was repaired but not again tested until the spring of nineteen fourteen seven years after langley's death such an accident occurring now would be regarded as a passing mishap but at that time it seemed to most people to demonstrate the futility of all aviation experiments the press overwhelmed the inventor with ridicule the great scientist himself referred to the accident as having frustrated the best work of his life although he felt confident of the final success of his experiments further financial support was not granted and he was forced to suspend operations scarcely could he anticipate that a decade later in a far-away little hamlet workmen who had never known him would with keenest enthusiasm rehabilitate that same tandem monoplane and launch it again and again in successful flight and that afterwards in the national capital it should be assigned the place of honour among the pioneer vehicles of the air when in march nineteen fourteen mr glenn h curtis was invited to send a flying boat to washington to participate in celebrating langley day footnote may six the anniversary of the famous flight of langley's steam model aeroplane in eighteen ninety six is known in washington as langley day and has been celebrated with aerial manoeuvres over land and water and footnote he replied i would like to put the langley aeroplane itself in the air learning of this remark secretary walcott of the smithsonian institution soon authorized mr curtis to re-canvas the original langley aeroplane and launch it either under its own propulsive power or with a more recent engine and propeller early in april therefore the machine was taken from the langley laboratory and shipped in a box-car to the curtis aviation field beside lake cuca hammondsport new york 
and the following month it was ready for its first trial since the unfortunate accident of 1903. The main objects of these renewed trials were, first, to show whether the original Langley machine was capable of sustained free flight with a pilot, and, secondly, to determine more fully the advantages of the tandem type of aeroplane. The work seemed a proper part of the general program of experiments planned for the recently reopened Langley Aerodynamical Laboratory. It was, indeed, for just such an experimentation that the aeroplane had been given to the Smithsonian Institution by the War Department, at whose expense it had been developed and brought to completion prior to 1903. After some successful flights at Hammondsport, the famous craft could, at the discretion of the Smithsonian Institution, either be preserved for exhibition or used for further scientific study. To achieve the two main objects above mentioned, the aeroplane would first be flown as nearly as possible in its original condition, then with such modifications as might seem desirable for technical or other reasons. Various ways of launching were considered. In 1903 the Langley aeroplane was launched from the top of a houseboat. A car supporting it and drawn by lengthy spiral springs ran swiftly along a track, then suddenly dropped away, leaving the craft afloat in mid-air, with its propellers whirring and its pilot supplementing, with manual control, if need be, the automatic stability of the machine. This method of launching, as shown by subsequent experimentalists, is a practical one and was favorably entertained by Mr. Curtis. He also thought of starting from the ground with wheels, from the ice with skates, from the water with floats. Having at hand neither a first-rate smooth field nor a sheet of ice, he chose to start from the water. In the accompanying illustrations, plates 1 and 2 show the appearance of the Langley flying machine after Mr. Curtis had provided it with hydro-aeroplane floats and their connecting truss work. The steel mainframe, the wings, the rudders, the engine and propellers all were substantially as they had been in 1903. The pilot had the same seat under the mainframe and the same general system of control as in 1903. He could raise or lower the craft by moving the big rear rudder up and down. He could steer right and left by turning the vertical rudder. He had no ailerons nor wing warping mechanism but for lateral balance depended upon the dihedral angle of the wings and upon suitable movements of his weight or of the vertical rudder. And here it may be noted that Langley had placed the vertical steering rudder under and to the rear of the center of gravity. So placed, it served as a fairly good aileron by exerting a turning movement about the longitudinal axis of the machine. After the adjustments for actual flight had been made in the Curtis factory, according to the minute descriptions contained in the Langley memoir on mechanical flight, the aeroplane was taken to the shore of Lake Cuca beside the Curtis hangars and assembled for launching. On a clear morning, May 28, and in a mild breeze, the craft was lifted onto the water by a dozen men and set going, with Mr. Curtis at the steering wheel, ensconced in the little boat-shaped car under the forward part of the frame. Many eager witnesses and cameramen were at hand, on shore and in boats. The four-winged craft, pointed somewhat across the wind, went skimming over the wavelets, then automatically headed into the wind, rose in level poise, soared gracefully for 150 feet, and landed softly on the water near the shore. Mr. Curtis asserted that he could have flown farther, but, being unused to the machine, imagined the left wings had more resistance than the right. The truth is that the aeroplane was perfectly balanced in wing resistance, but turned on the water like a weather vane, owing to the lateral pressure on its big rear rudder. Hence, in future experiments, this rudder was made turnable about a vertical axis as well as about a horizontal axis used by Langley. Henceforth, the little vertical rudder under the frame was kept fixed and inactive. After a few more flights with the Langley aeroplane, kept as nearly as possible in its original condition, 
its engine and twin propellers were replaced by a curtis eighty horse motor and direct connected tractor propeller mounted on the steel frame well forward as shown in the photographs it was hoped in this way to spare the original engine and propeller bearings which were none too strong for the unusual burden added by the floats in 1903 the total weight of pilot and machine had been 830 pounds with the floats lately added it was 1170 pounds with the curtis motor and all ready for flight it was 1520 pounds but notwithstanding these surplus additions of 40 per cent and 80 per cent above the original weight of the craft the delicate wing spars and ribs were not broken nor was any part of the machine excessively overstrained. Owing to the pressure of other work at the factory, the aeroplane equipped with the Curtis motor was not ready for further flights till September. In the absence of Mr. Curtis, who had gone to California in August, a pupil of his aviation school, Mr. Elwood Doherty, volunteered to act as a pilot during some trials for adjusting the aeroplane controls and the center of gravity mr doherty on the afternoon of september seventeen planed easily over the water rose on level wing and flew about four hundred fifty feet at an elevation of two or three yards as shown by the accompanying photographs of that date presently two other like flights were made Mr. Doherty found that with the four wings at 10 degrees incident, the rear ones at 12 degrees, and the pilot's seat on the main frame about midway between the wings, the flyer responded nicely to the movements of the pilot wheel. A slight turn of the wheel steered the craft easily to left or right, a slight pull or push raised or lowered it. The big double tail, or rudder, which responded to these movements, was the only steering or control surface used. The breaking of the eight-foot tractor screw terminated these trials for the day. The waves indicate the strength of the wind during the flights. On September 19, using a nine-foot screw, Mr. Doherty began to make longer flights. A pleasant offshore breeze rippled the water, but without raising whitecaps. A dozen workmen, lifting the great tandem monoplane from the shore, with the pilot in his seat, waded into the lake and set it gently on the water. A crowd of witnesses near at hand, and many scattered about the shores and on the lofty vine-clad hills, stood watching expectantly. When some of the official observers and photographers, in a motor-boat, were well out in the lake, a man in high-top boots, standing in the water, started the propeller and stepped quickly out of the way. Then, with its great yellow wings beautifully arched and distended, the imposing craft ran swiftly out from the shore, gleaming brilliantly in the afternoon sun. At first the floats and lower edges of the rudders broke the water to a white surge, then, as the speed increased, they rose more and more from the surface. Presently the rear floats and the rudders cleared the water, the front floats still skipping on their heels, white with foam. The whole craft was now in soaring poise. It quickly approached the photographers, bearing on its back the alert pilot, who seemed to be scrutinizing every part of it, and well satisfied to let it race. Then it rose majestically and sailed on even wing one thousand feet, sank softly, skimmed the water, and soared another thousand feet, grazed the water again, rose, and sailed three thousand feet, turned on the water and came back in the same manner, and, as it passed the photographers, soared again nearly half a mile. The flights were repeated a few minutes later, then, owing to squally weather, were discontinued for eleven days. On October 1, 1914, the aeroplane was launched at 11 a.m. in an offshore breeze strong enough to raise whitecaps. Hovering within 30 feet of the water and without material loss of speed, it made in quick succession flights of the following duration, as observed by four of us in a motorboat and timed by myself. 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 65 seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 45 seconds. As the speed through air averaged about 50 feet per seconds, 
the through air lengths of these flights were respectively one thousand feet one thousand feet three thousand two hundred fifty feet one thousand feet two thousand feet two thousand two hundred fifty feet as the aeroplane was now well out from shore among the heavy billows and white caps mr doherty landed it upon the water and turned it half about for the homeward flight thereupon the propeller tips struck the waves and were broken off one casting a splinter through the centre of the left wing the pilot stopped the engine rested in his seat and was towed home by our motorboat the flights were witnessed and have been attested by many competent observers as to the performance of the aeroplane during these trials the pilot mr e doherty reports and we observed that the inherent lateral stability was excellent the fore and aft control was satisfactory and the movement of the craft both on the water and in the air was steady and suitable for practical flying in such weather apparently the machine could have flown much higher and thus avoided touching the water during the lulls in the breeze but higher flying did not seem advisable with the frail trussing of wings designed to carry eight hundred thirty pounds instead of the one thousand five hundred twenty pounds actual weight at the present writing the langley aeroplane is in perfect condition and ready for any further tests that may be deemed useful but it has already fulfilled the purpose for which it was designed it has demonstrated that with its original structure and power it is capable of flying with a pilot and several hundred pounds of useful load it is the first aeroplane in the history of the world of which this can be truthfully said if the experiments be continued under more painstaking technical direction longer flights can easily be accomplished mr manley who designed the langley engine and screws and who directed the construction and tests of the large aeroplane up to december eighth nineteen o three reports that he obtained from the propulsion plant a static thrust of four hundred fifty pounds and that he once ran the engine under full load for ten hours consecutively this thrust is nearly one hundred pounds more than that commonly obtained at hammondsport with the same plant and twenty pounds more than the static thrust obtained with the curtis motor on the day when it flew the aeroplane with one thousand five hundred twenty pounds aggregate weight hence by restoring the engine and propellers to their original normal working condition they should be able to drive the aeroplane in successful flight with an aggregate weight of nearly one thousand six hundred pounds even when hampered with the floats and their sustaining truss work with a thrust of four hundred fifty pounds the langley aeroplane without floats restored to its original condition and provided with stronger bearings should be able to carry a man and sufficient supplies for a voyage lasting practically the whole day dr langley's aerotechnic work may be briefly summarized as follows one his aerodynamic experiments some published and some as yet unpublished were complete enough to form a basis for practical pioneer aviation two he built and launched in eighteen ninety six the first steam model aeroplane capable of prolonged free flight and possessing good inherent stability three he built the first internal combustion motor suitable for a practical man carrying aeroplane four he developed and successfully launched the first gasoline model aeroplane capable of sustained free flight five he developed and built the first man carrying aeroplane capable of sustained free flight end of the first man carrying aeroplane capable of sustained free flight langley's success as a pioneer in aviation by albert francis zahn read by avai in december 2013